Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. According to even Fox News, Trump is lagging in the polls. Is this because Joe Biden is such a brilliant candidate or because of the hardening consensus the pandemic has been badly handled by the president? Still another theory. Trump ran as a populist in 2016. Has he governed as one? To discuss this and more, in Denver, we're joined by Ted Harvey. He is the chairman of the Committee to Defend the President and a founding member of the Stop Hillary PAC. And in Monterey, we cross to Spencer Critchley. He is a former communications advisor to Obama for America 2008 and 2012, as well as a managing partner of communication consulting firm Boots Roads Group. All right, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Okay, let's go to Denver first. Uh, Ted, you know, I'm an avid watcher of programs like Tucker Carlson on Fox News. And, and so when I see uh, public opinion polls about Donald Trump on Fox, I tend to take, take, the, take them very seriously. And now we all know that the 2016 polls were off, and off enough for the election to come out differently than expected. So I really don't want to hear that the polls are off. Let's talk about what the polls really mean. Why is the president lagging in the polls? Well, I honestly, to your original point, I, I don't believe the polls at all. Um, I don't think the president is lagging in the polls. The, the same pollster for, for Fox News in, on October 19th of 2016 had Hillary Clinton up by nine points. Um, I think with the current way that we do polling the with cell phones and caller ID, I think it's pretty hard to do an accurate poll. Um, but I do believe that the media has done an incredible job of destroying this administration since the day he raised yeah. his hand and got sworn in and with the Mueller investigation, with the, uh, the impeachment fiasco. And, and now you have the coronavirus, and uh, I think the president has handled the coronavirus very well, but you look at the media and it's wall to wall. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. So it's not surprising that the, the president's poll numbers are not as strong as they should be when you have the entire media establishment doing everything they can to destroy him. Okay, well, Spencer, you way in there. I mean, it, it's so uh, with, with Ted saying it's it's the polls are off. Okay, I'm going to uh, 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 hold my decision on that. Um, I mean, consistently across the board here, um, that he's doing very poorly. Um, it, it seems to me that it's more issue driven, and it, it seems to me, in being an avid watcher of the president, it, my sense he's kind of lost the plot. Um, he seems to not be in his element like he used to be, but back in February and March. Go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, and um, you know I disagree about the polls. It's not just the Fox News poll. There, it's multiple polls over a long period of time. And of course, we have to recognize polls are only a sampling of reality. And of course, they have a margin of error built into them. But over time, it's definitely a trend. And I agree. I think the president uh, has lost the plot that got him elected. And uh, I actually, if I may, I, I have a new book called Patriots of Two Nations, which. Uh, helps especially people on my side of the fence understand support for President Trump beyond the, the I think, oversimplified explanations, they're all racists or they're all ignorant or, or whatever. Um, and I think ultimately it's a different view of reality. And he was appealing to a reality that dates back to the founding of the country, which is a, a counter-enlightenment view of reality that focuses more on culture and loyalty and faith as opposed to science uh, facts and logic and the, the social contract. And I think actually that's what he was appealing to was people who responded to what they saw as an appeal to things like faith and culture. But I think he's mistaken it for just the racist element. There's certainly an element of racism in support for Trump. Not all of his supporters are racist, of course, but he seems to be doubling down on the ugliest parts of the base of support for him. And I think that's where he's losing, well, losing the plot, as you say. Yeah, but that's kind of very the definition of the culture wars because you can you can look at it. I mean, a, a, a lot of Trump supporters and let's look at Mount Rushmore, the speech there, which I think was one of the best speeches of his presidency. And I can understand how some people would interpret it in a very negative light. His supporters saw it in a very positive light. Ted, let me go back to you and let's say with the Mount Rushmore speech because I think it was very very interesting. If I could just be kind of simplistic here, he spoke to the heart. And I thought it was a very heart-rendering speech. 
but we're in the middle of an economic turndown and a pandemic. He didn't talk much to the stomach. And, I, and that would be my fault of that speech because you know we can talk about statues all we want, but if you don't have a job and you don't have any prospects for a job, that's going to stick with you more than talking about statues. Go ahead, Ted. Well, I think we do have a major culture war going on in this country right now, where you have the left that has taken over the Democrat Party, and they're trying to destroy everything that this country stands for. They're trying to destroy the, the, our capital cities. I'm in Denver. They, they have literally destroyed our capital in, in Denver. Um, they're tearing down statues, whether it's uh, United or, or um, what, what, whether it is um, abolitionists or whether it is Stevie Ray Vaughan or it doesn't matter who the statue is, they're tearing it down because they're trying to tear down the culture. Um, what the president's speech was, was speaking to that culture war that is going on. Yes, there are a, a lot of jobs that are being lost, and I think that the president has done an incredible job with the U.S. economy, even in this current situation. So I think he's dealing with that. But that speech right there was talking about why is America great as opposed to all of the other countries in the world, because we have the Declaration of Independence and we have the Constitution that sets up the individual as, as the um, apex of our government. And the government works for the individual, not the other way around. And that's what makes the United States unique in all of human history. And that's why the president's speech was so profound. Yeah, but Spencer, I, I would agree with you. I think Trump won the cultural war in 2016, but I think he can lose it in 2020 because of the economy. I, I still think that that fundamentally is how people go and respond. I mean, is you know, I live abroad. I've lived abroad for over 20 years, and you know, having to explain American politics sometimes can be very difficult because we have a president and we have 50 governors. Now, at the end of the day, he's you know, he's captain of the ship. He is responsible for the country, but. I, I sometimes worry when he says, well, these are just democratic cities and things like that. I, that's, you know, that is such a divisive thing to, uh, in fact, it, it's factually true, but for the commander in chief, the leader of the country to say, well, it's their fault. I, I think that really uh, sounds very hollow for a lot of people when we're in a national crisis. Go ahead, Spencer. All right, and the democratic cities frame is false. The uh, violent crime rate in the United States has been falling since uh, the early, the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, people constantly get encouraged to believe that America is a war zone in the cities, and in fact, we're safer we've been, than we've been in decades. Of course, there are areas of the country where there's terrible violence, but overall, we're much safer than we've been in many decades. Uh, but again, this gets to my larger point. I agree that, yes, it's a culture war, and it has been a culture war at least since the 60s. But in, in my book, I argue it actually goes back to the founding of the country. And it's, it's more than disagreement over culture. It's disagreement over how we define reality itself. And this is why liberals often have such a hard time uh, arguing, especially with Trump supporters, because, you know, people like me will, will come at them with factual uh, logic-based arguments and miss these other elements and realize that for many people who support Trump, there are different ways and what they would see as a higher way of defining the truth in many cases. Or they're looking at exactly the same phenomenon and, and will point to the evidence that what you're saying there or what you're doing there is an example of racial bigotry or religious bigotry. And they'll say, no, 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 I'm talking about tradition and I'm talking about uh, preserving our culture. That argument's never gonna be resolved uh, the two sides will just get more and more entrenched and more and more angry at each other. And the well, extent to which they yeah, define each other as evil is the greatest threat to democracy. So yeah, in my book, I show ways people can start to actually understand where the well, other side is coming from. Spencer, the, well, I, for me, I mean, I guess I, I'm going to jump into the end because it's. It, it, I firmly believe he, he did run as an outsider. He did run as a populist. And I fault him for not governing as a populist, okay? Particularly yeah, in his position. And I, th I think he that's serves his billionaires and corporations essentially. Right. I think that's his greatest weakness there. When you know, Ted, you know, when when the the first wave of the, the stimulus or bailouts or whatever you want to call call them, you know, it was concierge service for the very rich and powerful. It wasn't for Main Street. It wasn't for Middle America. And then I was watching Senator Kennedy 
uh, on the morning uh, program Sunday, and he was asked point blank, you know, what, what, what's going on with the next stimulus and bailout? And he said, well, maybe it'll come, maybe it won't. I mean, it, it just seems like half the country is just left, let down. It's just that they're in a huge crisis right now, and I don't understand the inaction. I mean, the, the, the presidency is the most powerful thing of the presidency is a pulley pulpit is to be able to stand up and say, I want airtime, and this is how this administration is going to move. Hell or high water, what the GOP is going to do, or the Democrats. Why doesn't he do that, Ted? Well, I do agree with you that he ran as a populist president, and, and that's why he did get elected, because he said he would um, go and help those forgotten Americans that the Democrats and Republicans alike for the last three decades have, have left behind and they've shipped out their manufacturing jobs around the world and and that it has led to huge unemployment in in the rust belt around the country and you look at his policies for the first three years and he fulfilled all of those follow-up policies he, he did bring back manufacturing jobs he he did lower unemployment for African Americans for Hispanic Americans for um, women around the country those are those are not uh, racist policies that Spencer keeps talking about. Those are policies that raise all ships, whether whether they are red, yellow, black, and white, male or female. Those are populist policies that got passed, and that's why his poll numbers. If you look at the, inside the poll numbers that you all keep talking about, his poll numbers on the economy are still about 55, 56 percent across the board on all of those policies because the American people realize that on that key issue. He is working hard for all Americans, a populist policy, and, and it is working. When you, when you start looking at the way the media has tried to destroy him on the, the coronavirus, and then you see the, the radical lefts, the leftists that are tearing down our, our country in these inner cities. Yes, they are inner cities that are being run by Democrat governors and Democrat mayors. That, that, that is undeniable, that elections have consequences, and if you want to have a mayor that's going to tell their police to stand down and let these radicals be able to destroy their cities, that's a legitimate argument for the president to make, and that's really what this election is going to be about. Do you want mob rule or do you want the rule of law? And that's what this election is going to be about. It's not going to be about the coronavirus. Spencer, go ahead, Re reply to that. Sure. And, you know, it's not the media that's killing more than 140,000 Americans through bungling the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. And these protests in the cities are almost entirely peaceful. And uh, most Americans are horrified by the sight of U.S. military, especially unmarked U.S. military, snatching people off the streets. This is supposed to be one of the greatest outrages at all for libertarians and conservatives. And I'll say that the reason the reason that uh, the reason, we have Democrats the reason that the president is in so much trouble the reason that, you can't, you can't the talk, reason, you can't talk the over reason, you know, right it's my it's my turn it's my I'm turn ted ted it's my turn said it's my turn wait, ted wait, wait. ted i'm sorry it's my turn um the reason the president is in trouble in so many polls is uh, again gets back to my thesis i believe that people who have sworn their loyalty under the worldview of the people who support him it's admirable their loyalty is strong uh but on the other hand what will shake it uh, is displays of unworthiness, in his case, corruption okay. and incompetence. Okay. Censor, hold that thought. We're going to go to a, sh a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion about Trump and Poland. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing why Trump is lagging in the polls. Okay, Ted, I want you to respond to what Spencer said before we went to the break. Go ahead. Well, Spencer's argument that this is just peaceful demonstrations is factually ridiculous. Um, that we wouldn't be having these talk discussions about these riots if they were peaceful. You go look at the Colorado Capitol, and they are the, the Colorado Capitol is destroyed. There are windows shot out. Legis legislators' cars had their windows shot out. People are being beaten up all across the country. And look in Portland, people are being beaten up and the cops are being beaten up. This is not peaceful demonstrations. This is radical leftists that are trying to destroy the United States. And for Democrats, for Spencer to be um, essentially apologizing for that tells you where we are as a country. 
that the left, you, you, the mayor of Denver, the mayor of Portland, the mayor of, of, of Seattle is out there marching with the Black Lives Matter and saying this is okay to be doing this. That this is not okay. Yeah, marching is fine in a democracy. Marching is fine. Civil but disobedience that, is absolutely fine, and, and but the, it's the job of police to protect civil disobedience. And they aren't because they've been, the, the, the 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 police have been called down whenever there is violence, whenever they are destroying private property. These Democrat these Democrat mayors are telling the police to stand down, and that's that's completely irresponsible. We have a civilized government to protect the civil liberties of our citizens. And these mayors in these towns and in these states are not doing it. Okay, Spencer, you know, one of the things that I, I found really quite disturbing is particularly in the city of Minneapolis, after all of the destruction, and I think we'd all agree there was a lot of destruction in that city. Um, and then they He's turn around and, and they turn around and they say, wait, well, they want federal assistance when they abandon the, the, the precinct to, to the rioters and the looters. I mean, I, I, I know it's the reason why I'm saying that is that this, 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 um, uh, economic crisis, uh, this pande pandemic, then we have uh, the George Floyd incident here. It is being politicized, and I won't deny it's being politicized on both sides, but this is certainly, the left is enjoying this because it is for the first time, in my humble opinion, Trump has found himself to be a bit paralyzed. Go ahead, Spencer. This is happening because Trump is facing the serious crises we've all been afraid uh, would come along and knew would have to come sooner or later. The, the left is, Peter, is certainly not enjoying this. Nobody's, nobody's enjoying it. Um, part of what we're hearing from Ted, um, unfortunately, and too often from uh, uh, folks who support Trump, especially people in the media who support Trump, is the cherry picking of a few emotionally salient stories and using those to substitute for the broader reality. And, and unfortunately, this takes advantage of a feature of our, the way our minds work. We're much more you know, worried about the single shark that might attack us than about statistics that show that swimming in the ocean is probably safe. Um, and this is one of those cases. This is very much a case where almost all of these uh, so-called riots are peaceful protests. And the United States of America is founded on the protection of people's rights to disagree with each other and even engage in civil disobedience if they feel strongly enough, as long as they don't engage in violence. I, by the way, have uh, spent many years as part of my experience working with police departments, including in situations where we had similar situations over issues of police use of force. So I think this is an area that I actually know quite a lot about. And a good police department, their first priority is to protect, protect the safety of everybody. And the department that I, would, that I was working with in, in the most uh, serious of these cases their first priority in responding to protests was to ensure those protests were peaceful and to protect the safety of protesters, many of whom were calling them terrible names. That's a real American police department. To see what happened in Lafayette Square in front of the White House, one of our most powerful symbols of democracy against peaceful protests, was a travesty. And it, it brought shame on our country well, around but, the world. But Spencer, I think there are people that are using peace, the, the concept and the process of peaceful uh, protesting. And there, there are a number of people that are abusing it. And I think yes, there's, there, there's yes, and they, plenty and nobody of, supports those people. Plenty of video evidence of that. I mean, that's just not talking heads. It's really quite horrific, all right? I mean, you have, you know, painting um, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, on a street. Uh, it's okay for some people to paint that, but then there's other people that come by and say, I'm going to paint over it, but they're the ones that get in trouble for it for not for people that are painting on the street in the first place. I mean, it's really quite a one-sided and hypocritical. Let, let's no. let Ted... Let but the elected authorities are painting on the street by, by their legitimate okay, well, authority. Well, then First Amendment freedom of expression. The other, the other version nobody is, seems to is care vandalism. About, nobody seems but, to care about property, okay? Why are we in favor of vandalism? Why are we in favor of vandalism by I'm white people painting over Black Lives violent. Matter? But we're, we, we send federal, unmarked federal troops after vandals in Portland, Oregon. This, this then, kind of violence the New York City the vandals vandals here. go after there's no bail, okay? I mean... You know, it, 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 there's two sides to all of this, and you can see how I can understand how both sides get very upset. Ted, you've been real quiet. Go ahead. Well, it, uh, I think it's interesting that Spencer didn't respond to your the, the, your comment about Minneapolis asking for five hundred million dollars for the damage done by the peaceful protesters that didn't do anything in the peaceful protests that night. 
Um, the, the reason why we're having these discussions is not because they are peaceful protests. Yes, there are people out there that are protesting peacefully, but it, it is that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these radical leftists that are destroying private property, hurting police officers, and hurting fellow citizens. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the peaceful protests. Everybody agrees we should be able to have peaceful protests, and I agree that we should be talking about um, abuses of the police department. And as a state legislator for 13 years here in Colorado, I worked very hard to deal with some of these issues that are dealing with police brutality. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the radical leftists that are destroying private property, are hurting people, are tearing down statues and trying to destroy what it means to be an American. And that is what I think will be the, the key issue going into the November election, is do you want the Democrat Party, which has been taken over by the left, or do you want the Republican Party and Trump that is for the rule of law? And I think in the end, the American people, your average hardworking blue collar Democrat and unaffiliated out there are going to look at those two extremes and say, we are not these radical leftists that have taken over the Democrat party. That's not the party of JFK. Yeah, but, you know, but there's a problem with that. Let me go to Spencer here. I mean, one of the things I think is really quite fascinating is that in, in 2016, Donald Trump was very successful in towering crooked Hillary. I mean, it worked. Lock her up. It worked. Okay. It's almost impossible to do that to old Sleepy Joe, okay? It's hard to dislike him. I think he's a crook, okay? And his foreign policy decisions for decades, I think, are horrendous. But nonetheless, old Sleepy Joe. The problem is, is it worked with Hillary because it was easy. With Joe, it's a lot harder. Go ahead, Spencer. Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you... Uh... Who else uh, is uh, doesn't want to see radical leftists take over the Democratic Party? Is the actual Democratic Party uh, in reality? Exactly, and, they're, and, they're being used. And, this and is Joe, a ruse. This is a ruse. It's a ruse because uh, Joe Biden. He, is he exactly? A, what is he radical about? <laughs> no, I mean that's this is why it's not sticking. I I've worked with Joe Biden, and like everybody who's worked with Joe Biden, I love him. He's he's a wonderful person. You can certainly disagree, if you like, with any and all of his positions and actions throughout his career. I think he was right about a lot of stuff. And for example, the stimulus program, which he he managed as one of the uh, most uh, efficient and uh, corruption-free, uh, waste-free, uh, massive government programs in our history. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, Joe Biden is just a likable person, and, and he his one of his greatest strengths is that he connects with average Americans so effectively. Hillary Clinton, I, you know, I I think the crooked Hillary stuff was essentially made up, but she made she enabled it. She the behavior she engaged in, like with the email server, uh, invited this kind of stuff, and, and she also had, and and that kind of comment, which actually feeds into again, <laughs> if I make my book. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, you know, this is a problem the left has is coming across as all in their heads and not enough in their hearts and, and coming across with this sense of, well, look, we figured this all out scientifically. So we know the correct answer. And if you don't understand it, it's because you're a little slow and just let us, uh, explain it to you. And unfortunately, Hillary tended to project that kind of attitude and Joe Biden definitely does not. And in fact, he has a lot of the populist strengths that Donald Trump does in that he makes a connection with the average person. I think this is why President Trump rapid, is, so is so afraid of him. We're rapidly running out of time. Ted, well, for the life of me, I don't understand why Trump doesn't go to the left of Biden and, 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 and push for a Marshall Plan. I mean, really go out. I mean, it's within his power at least to, uh, to push it publicly. But we, this, this um, uh, executive order to, to buy American, Joe got, a, got ahead of him on that. It's amazing to me. It's still sitting on Trump's desk. He won't sign it because he's, he's beholden to special interests around him, antithetical to what he ran on in 2016. And Ted, it makes me angry. It makes me angry because Joe <laughs> was able to get pull one over on Trump because he says, well, oh, then we'll buy American. Trump has the power, but, but uh, Biden has the rhetoric. Go ahead. 
Well, I'm, I don't ever want uh, Donald Trump to go to the left of Joe Biden. Um, that's a scary thought. No, no, and no. I, and let me let me just in, in the terms of a stimulus to help middle class people. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not being ideological here. I'm talking about a policy tool. They rescued the rich and powerful. They need to rescue the middle class. That in that sense, in that sense only. I am a I'm a, a, a conservative in good standing, my friend. Don't worry. <laughs> Well, as a, as a true conservative, I can tell you that I don't want the government to be bailing out as many people as they already have. The fact that we have already given $4 trillion to big business, small business, and, and people who weren't out of a job, um, I, I am more worried about that and the impact that that's going to have on the economy moving forward than I am of the coronavirus. I, I think that the fact that you have essentially five states that are run by five governors that have uh, five, five Democrat governors that have shut down their economies going into the November election is going to have a greater impact on our world economy, not just the United States economy, but the world economy than anything Donald Trump could do to try to solve that problem. When you have California shutting down, they're the seventh largest economy in the world, and they're shutting it down. That That is one you have a huge act on rapidly rapid, running out of time. I'm just going to add, I want a yes no answer from Spencer. Will Trump regret that they that um, Congress and that he himself as president bailed out the rich and most powerful before Main Street? Yes or no? Oh yes, yes. All right, gentlemen, that's all the time we had. This was very spirited. I very much enjoyed it. I want to thank my guests in Monterey and and in Denver. I want to thank our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. Remember, cross that news.